Um, so a word about uh, us. Uh, we're working at Datalog. Um, if you don't know us, our company is providing uh, observability as a service uh, at scale. I guess our flagship product historically has been collecting metrics and showing dashboards, but today we have many more things. Uh, alerts, uh, APM, synthetic, security. Um, my name is Christian. I'm working as a senior software engineer at Datalog. So, and my first encounter with Casanova was in 2016, I think. Small cluster, three nodes. Um, things have changed here since. Um, and when I'm not on computers, I run. Went for a run yesterday, went for a run today. We'll go for a run tomorrow. You get the ID. Uh, and Steve, my coworker, um, senior software engineer as well, is the team lead of our Cassandra team, which is composed about roughly six engineers, like six exactly uh, at this time. So uh, what are we going to talk about? Um, first, um, explain you a bit what Temple is and why it's a great fit for us. And then we'll dive into two very concrete examples, you know, get our hands dirty on uh, the health check team and migrations. We, here we are talking about moving data from one place to the other, not schema migrations, so that kind of migrations. And, and then we'll give you an idea of what's our future. Um, what problem are we trying to solve? Um, of course, we run 24 hours a day. You possibly do the same. For us, it's really critical. I've been mean, several companies, but they did on. People rely on us to just know if anything goes wrong, so we have to be more reliable than our customers, long story made short. Um, we run hundreds of clusters, thousands of nodes, uh, numbers of changing, but that's fairly big. Um, and w one thing, since we are full Kubernetes in the company, um, Kubernetes came after Cassandra, and Cassandra and its design makes assumptions that are not that Kubernetes friendly, so you have to just you know, uh, navigate through this, uh, and it gets uh, a little complicated. Um, also, um, our infrastructure is always changing. Uh, when I joined the company, it was just virtual machines all over the place, only one cloud provider. Now we have multiple cloud providers, we're full Kubernetes, and even within the Kubernetes world, we've been through different ways of using it, and you have to adapt your thing, move it from one place to the other, just deal with the computing world is ever uh, always changing. And, um, and also, you know, our team is not uh, that big and we are spawned on different time zones. So you, this has an impact on operations. Uh, so what is Temple? Uh, I got that from the Temple website. Um, you know, that looks great, it's going to um, simplify your code, um, make your applications more reliable and everything. You want that, but what is Temple exactly? Let's just you know, dive back into uh, ops. Um, in the beginning, I guess everybody is doing you know, that simple thing of running shell script, like not even shell script, like bash comments. Uh, you, you read this tutorial on how to do this or that with Cassandra, where you just like shoot some comments and, and do things, and that's what you do initially. And then at some point, um, as you organize yourself, you kind of document this because you don't want your coworkers to rerun, like hit the same walls you've been hitting, so you just document the process. And you get a run book that tells you to do this, do that, 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 that. And at some point you figure out, well, those engineers, they're just doing this sequentially, uh, why don't you write a script that does this automatically? Uh, and so, you know, you turn your roadbook into some kind of script that does the thing, uh, has been hopefully tested a little bit. And then you can go one step further and have your scripts be orchestrated, organized. Uh, I'm naming a few tools that allow you to do that, Chef, Ansible, um, whatever. Basically, you have this thing under control and you know that whenever you deploy something, a bunch of things are going to happen and you get the thing under control. And then Kubernetes takes it a step further. You just describe, hey, I want this state. I want these things. Please do the magic behind the scenes and converge to that state I want. And it's just going to run all the comments that are needed. So why would we need Temple? Temple uh, actually is a workflow engine 
Think of a workflow as a script on steroids. It's really a sequence, a program, a sequence of uh, actions that is running. And Temple is going to orchestrate that. Uh, why is that important? Uh, we'll see that later in detail, but it allows you uh, to typically know what's running, uh, at which state uh, is it. It's going to retry things. Uh, it provides you a single pane of glass of whatever is happening in your infrastructure. And, and it's a great addition to all the other things, like all these five things, run books, bash scripts, uh, bash comments, um, tools that bundle them together, or um, Kubernetes, they all coexist together. It's not like one is replacing the other. Um, a pattern that we used a lot on, on Kubernetes is the toolbox. This thing is kind of the old world of virtual machines making its way to uh, Kubernetes. It's not really Kubernetes-ish. You are not you know, recommended, to do, recommended to do that, but it's really efficient. It's like, almost it feels like you're SSHing on your server or uh, your infrastructure, and you have this you know, site thing where you can run comments. And on our toolbox, typically we have comments uh, like this rolling cleanup, which is doing exactly what it is written on the tin, it's all the cleanup on uh, all the, the nodes, and a bunch of other comments. And that's a useful pattern that we still have today. And let me describe you a little bit our temple setup. So we have this orange zone with the temple server, so that's just you know the headquarters of temple, so you have this application running. Uh, and then it delegates the execution of scripts to, of workflows to the temple workers. So here we have two different workers. They are in, like each color represents a Kubernetes cluster. And worker blue is going to operate on these Cassandra X and Y, and worker green, or light blue is it, is going to operate on the other ones. And temple does the work of dispatching things in that place, in that place, you know, uh, it, it does the magic behind the scenes. And you'll notice one thing is that there's a Cassandra that is operated by Temple and that powers Temple. So when you operate on that cluster, you just pay attention because you could break things, but we've always been fine. Uh, here are a few random names of uh, our workflows. Uh, they are self-explanatory, deployment, health, cleanup, uh, list start pods, replace nodes, rebuild nodes. We do pretty much everything with them. Um, so now one thing, the health check. Um, that has been a really important building block for us. Um, it's just about answering this simple question. Is my cluster okay? And that is not you know, something that is like either totally okay or totally broken if you've been working with Cassandra. So the other thing that from the K, uh, Kubernetes point of view is going to be, uh, it's okay if uh, all my pods are just ready and have their uh, readiness check okay. Uh, from the Cassandra point of view, node tool status is going to tell you those nodes are up and working, those nodes are not, and depending on which Cassandra node you're asking, uh, you'll have a possibly different answer. On the four node cluster, it's rare, but on the 200 nodes cluster, well, your management may vary. And then there are monitors. We are like a monitoring company, and at some point, you are maybe um, your node is at 99% CPU. Maybe it's at 98% disk usage. It's not okay. You may not proceed. So it depends. Uh, so yeah, th this thing has been really a very useful building block. We use it pretty much for everything, uh, deployments, node replacements, migrations. Um, and one thing that is really important is that by building this block, it helped us you know, enforce good practices uh, like and, and things went much more reliable once we had something that was like reliably telling us, hey, you can move forward. And that is possibly the most important slide I'm going to talk about. I'm going to move a little bit because uh, I need to show things. Uh, this in the temple um, world is an activity, this uh, purple block. Purple blocks are activities and there are retriable chunks, something that Temple is going to retry if anything fails. And inside are just function calls, and one block like this is a workflow. So let's take workflow one, 
uh, you run your thing, you do a health check, the check is okay. So you proceed to A. A fails. Oh, that's too bad. Then you retry the whole activity. And then to so retry, check A okay. Uh, now A is okay, B is okay. Proceed, go to activity two. Now the check fails. And this is usually typically fatal. Uh, if the check fails, you just stop everything. That means the cluster is not healthy. I'm not moving forward. I'm not retrying anything. The other example on the right, I'm not going to detail it, but the semantics is different. There's only one check. So you could end in this situation at the end where C is being retried, there's been no check before it. And we tend to prefer the first option on the left, but it does have a cost because the check itself can be lengthy um, because imagine it's going to do in some variants like a nodal status, uh, the equivalent of nodal status on all the nodes. So you have a big cluster, it's going to be lots of calls. It could be up to 10 minutes or something. Do you want your workflow to wait 10 minutes uh, each time? That's a design question. But I think we really made great progress being forced to ask us all these questions. And now uh, most of our operations are like more reliable. To sum up, a health check looks really simple. You're just like, does it work? Does it not work? But you know, you have to dive into the details. And I'm gonna let Steve talk about another use case. Thank you, Christian. Hey everyone, I'm Steve. I'm gonna be talking about another use case of ours for Temporal, which is migrations. So health checks are kind of the building blocks, but this uh, workflow is gonna be a little bit more complex and a lot more moving parts. But with the continuous evolution in technology, infrastructure migrations are inevitable as teams constantly try to improve in performance, scalability, and reliability uh, within their systems. Uh, in the time I've been here, uh, we've undergone a number of these migrations. We've transitioned our Cassandra infrastructure from a non-Kubernetes environment to a Kubernetes environment. We've migrated Cassandra clusters across Kubernetes clusters, and we've migrated our Cassandra clusters from our initial Kates config to an operator ecosystem. All of these migrations involve a large number of engineering hours with incredibly high stakes as we're moving massive amounts of data that are critical to our product and our customers. And it's really difficult. There are many, many steps involved. Health and safety checks are required. Actions need to be repeatable and reliable. And as Christian mentioned earlier, uh, with the evolution of operations, Temporal solves a lot of these problems for us. So let's dive a little deeper into the progression of our migration between Kubernetes clusters and how it evolved over time. So we designed the workflow with three things in mind. It needed to be robust. It was gonna run for all of our Cassandra clusters, varying both node count and density across multiple data centers, and multiple cloud provider regions. It was gonna move massive amounts of data and we needed to have the utmost confidence in the automated operations that would be executed by Temporal. Uh, it needed to be pragmatic. It was okay for us if it wasn't just a single button press. Although that'd be great, having pausing points in between would give us and the application team a chance to assess progress and verify that there haven't been any lapses in performance. Uh, but we did want to automate the boring parts. Streaming operations between nodes take many hours, depending on uh, cluster size, density, and we didn't want an engineer to have to sit there and monitor constantly for completion. Lastly, we didn't want to waste, re waste resources and double the cost of our cluster by standing up an entirely new cluster and doing a rebuild from there. Uh, we also had wanted to design, uh, design it with uh, making it incremental. Uh, we knew the workflow wouldn't be a complete product from the start, but it would help us achieve our goal in the short term, um, and we would build it with reusable and adaptable components like the health check. So the core logic was converted from an initial migration that we'd used previously, but as it developed uh, and we encountered more nuanced situations, features were added, such as being able to pause and resume at different points in the workflow. So if we look at what the typical timeline would look like manually, in practice what we wanted to do is a series of node replacements where the old node was in the source Kubernetes cluster and the new node was in the destination Kubernetes cluster. So thinking of how this would work in manual operations, the timeline would look like this. We prepare node one, we perform a cluster-wide health check, we'd stop the previous node, we'd prepare the new node for the replacement, we'd start up the node, and we'd let the replica stream in all the data and wait a long time. Start for the next node and the next node until all the nodes had been converted from the source cluster to the new cluster. So there's an obvious pattern here, and we knew that streaming would take the majority of the time. If we were to do this manually, there would be constant uh, changing of context as we look to see if 
the streaming has completed and we can move on to the next node. This was the perfect situation for Temporal, which could start the next node replacement as soon as the previous node was finished and sufficient health checks were completed. So here's a simplified diagram of what this migration would look like in a Kate's environment. This is a Cassandra cluster composed of a single stateful set striped across the AZs for high availability. This means that nodes migrated to the, Kubernetes to the new Kubernetes cluster are going to be housed in a separate stateful set on the right. But we need to ensure that data is kept consistent across racks and availability zones. Therefore, we need to be a little bit more careful than simply scaling up the new stateful set and scaling down the other stateful set. So instead, we need to work in batches of three and slowly decrease the size of the source stateful set to reduce the risk of being in an unhealthy state. So on the left here, pods three, four, and five have already been migrated and correspond to ordinals zero, one, and two on the right. To add ordinal three, we needed to replace pod zero since it's in the same AZ and let the cluster stream in the replicated data. We can't just scale down the stateful set at that point because that would delete pod two, which still is an active replica. So all these steps that I described needed to be implemented in our workflow for it to be successful, which meant deciding which of these actions were retriable, interacting not only with Cassandra, but the Kubernetes API, understanding what the different failure mechanisms are, and how to gracefully fail if things go wrong. So if we take a step back and look at this migration as a whole, we could start to visualize some of the building blocks that would make up the workflow. We have our macro plan, which is what we wanted the general flow to look like, starting with the health check, interrogating the clusters for configuration info, a confirmation prompt, muting monitors, and finally migrating the nodes. Then we also have individual steps for migrating a single node, including another health check, updating replace address flags, alternating Kate's resources, and monitoring for completion. Each of these bullets correspond to either a retrieval activity or an entirely separate workflow. And as I said earlier, we valued reusable, adaptable components that could be linked together. Workflows are the building blocks of Temporal, and by creating these sub-workflows, we are helping develop components that can be utilized in future workflows. The workflow on the right is something we actually still use today in our daily operations for cluster management. These steps are a real program, and a very complicated one at that. Building it required numerous designs, reviews, and many tests with a goal to constantly improve. Although our initial implementation automated a number of steps, there is still a process both for our team and the application team that occurred in tandem alongside the workflow. Our teams would sync to develop a migration plan, we'd bootstrap the new cluster, launch the workflow, confirm the plan, let it migrate some nodes, reconvene with the application team to update some config, launch the second half of the workflow, all while monitoring dashboards to ensure that there are no deep lapses in performance. We wanted to, <laughs> the one thing to notice is that on our side, the Cassandra team, we had a lot more steps here, uh, but that's by design. We wanted migrations to be seamless, non-intrusive, and require minimal engineering hours from application teams to reduce the total burden of the migration and increase their team's confidence for future migrations. And that worked for a while, but we continued to iterate, and we had the incentive to do so, which was reducing our own burden for the migrations. We dog food our own tools, and we were constantly seeking to improve the pain points we were, we were experiencing. In a later state shown here, the total amount of coordination and effort was greatly reduced and improved to the point where it was basically a single button press. We could reach out to the team and say, hey, just a heads up, we're going to move a bunch of your nodes in the background. Let us know if you see anything suspicious, but we don't need anything from you. And we could launch the workflow and let it migrate all the nodes behind the scenes. Improvements didn't just come from us. This was largely possible due to a service product uh, from our traffic team that allowed nodes across different Kubernetes clusters to be discovered transparently. Improvements also came in the form of safety. We were launching a lot of migration workflows as well as workflows for daily operations, but we needed a way to stay out of each other's way. We're six teammates spread across two countries and multiple time zones and require plenty of coordination to avoid stepping on each other's toes. Enter distributed locks, a product created by a sister team which we were able to integrate into our workflows that ensured only a single workflow was operating on a Cassandra cluster at a given time. In conclusion, moving data is hard, but with tools like Temporal, it makes the job much more manageable. Doing this entire migration manually would have taken much more time and would have been much more susceptible to human error, although it was still not immune from the occasional fat finger. This quote really resonated with us when we were designing workflows. Creating workflows that were deterministic and creating identity activities reshaped the way we thought about our current runbooks and future ones as we wrote them specifically with automation in mind. What does our future look like? Migrations to more cloud-friendly infra, cloud infra, upgrades to new versions of Cassandra, or possibly even moves to alternative storage solutions. I can't say for sure what our infra future will look like, but I can say with some level of confidence that Temporal will help us automate our cluster-level operations. That doesn't mean that there won't be roadblocks along the way. 
As we develop these workflows for specific situations, they may eventually become unused and deprecated. We're proud to remove dead code and keep our repositories light, and it's okay to retire something, but there is a cost to clean up and untying dependencies. We can also envision a world where workflows get triggered automatically, maybe after a monitor fires. How can we be confident that the situation calls for that exact workflow and not something else? These are questions we have to ask ourselves. Temporal can solve a lot of problems, and it's greatly reduced our dedicated ops time. And it's natural to want to automate all the things, but it doesn't mean it can or should solve every problem. Thank you. Any questions? When you're looking at like the operator versus like enhancing the operator versus putting something into temporal, how do you make that decision? Uh, th th that's a great question. Um, I think one clear, um, like if it depends on something that is not in Kubernetes, like typically uh, some uh, monitor or uh, some external resources, we're not going to use the operator. Uh, there's also uh, something related to the release process. Releasing your workflow is, is rather easy. It's just about deploying uh, a single worker. If you get it wrong, you can revert easily. If you enhance your operator, you're just like committing to something deeper. Uh, so that's how I would you know, determine whether I want one or the other. Um, as of today, most workflows are for something rather out of the norm. That is, you do it regularly, but ideally you would never do it. Ideally, I would never replace a node. I mean, why would I do that? Uh, you know, but I need to do it. I don't know, pretty basic question, but what impact have your customers seen based on the implementation? Or have you actually seen anything really in terms of you know customers able to access their data, see their dashboards? Um, That's probably something you can answer. But. I, think, I think honestly the impact has been mostly positive uh, or maybe nothing. I think like the, the, the real Good thing has been on our side, on the ops side. Uh, typically, like the migration example Steve mentioned, um, we used to do migrations before. Like I, I had been doing some primitive Cassandra operations before, and it was painful. And and also, you know, you have this uh, mental uh, pressure of I need to think tomorrow that I need to clean up this thing and not forget this uh, step or that step. Uh, so I think that the progress was really for us uh, as operators. And then, you know, if we're not spending time on the user's things, that means that we're spending time on the right things that make the service better. I think for our customers, the change is really there. Like we're doing the right thing and we're doing useful things as opposed to wasting our time on useless tasks like, repetit like repetitive tasks at which humans are not great. I, at least I am not great at doing this. Mm -hmm. Workflows are better than me. So um, I wanted to ask, when you switched your workflow to being a, a simpler process for your team, it seemed like you'd skip the, te the step for informing the customer teams that you had a new host in, which made me wonder if you'd switch to a different form of discovery for your clusters. Yeah, so that was due to a service product by our traffic team, which basically had a DNS address that could resolve to either of our clusters at a given time. So from their perspective, they were connecting to one address, but what was behind that address was completely transparent to them. Um, so we could control what the infra was behind and move the entire cluster without their DNS address changing. Oh, without their address? Because I was going to ask, did you find switching to DNS cause you any loss in availability or, or resiliency? Uh, no, we had very little, uh, I'd say, like loss of availability during these migrations. I think occasionally, if we migrated nodes and like somebody forgot to update the DNS address in the original versions, those were times where we would see that. Or if 
uh, you know, there was one node left and then we brought that one down, they would immediately lose access to it. Um, so it's like small configuration changes like that, which is why that service product ended up being a nice win for us because we were able to not have to interact with the application team um, and could reduce their time of saying, okay, let's make this change, let's roll this deployment out to all of our data centers and verify everything before we can finish the rest of the migration. Great, thanks. But uh, just to add, add a little bit, something that was complicated is that due to the fact that Cassandra, you know, exposes the topology to clients and to wherever you come from, it was complicated for us to just be 100% sure that we're, they were using the right address and not a specific address because, you know, the TCP traffic at some point is just like coming from anywhere. Uh, so we have ways to mitigate that, but that was um, a small issue, yes. <laughs>